If we're to understand the ecumenical movement, we have to first place it into context, our understanding of the church, and then where the ecumenical movement has its roots, and who planted those roots. First let us remind ourselves that the church does not belong to man, it is not a creation of man, it is God's alone. We do not enter the church through a simple proclamation of faith, personal, individualized faith. Though faith is important, vital, we enter the church through baptism and chrismation. It is God that makes us members of the church. We remind ourselves that the apostles, though they, they saw, they witnessed the risen Christ, they touched him, they ate with him. They were not yet the church, though they believed, though they had a faith. They were made the church at Pentecost with the descent of the Holy Spirit. We are made into members of the church by God. There are people today who are being assured by their leaders that it is enough just to personally believe and they are part of the church. This has never been a part of Christian belief. This is not the church's teaching. The church is the body of Christ. It cannot be divided. It is impossible for the church to be divided. The church can be wounded, even as the flesh of Christ was wounded. We may see the church wounded from without and within, but never divided. There is in the Protestant Christian groups a belief in a thing called the branch theory, the idea that the church is separated into many, many branches. Of course, Protestants must believe this, otherwise how else can they can claim that bodies that they belong to that didn't exist in the f before the 1500s have any claim to being linked with the true Church of Christ, except through personal faith, of course. But the Church does not believe this. The Church is one. There is only one Church. Christ did not establish churches. He established the Church. One faith, one baptism. And so to suggest that the church is divided is to teach that the body of Christ itself is divided. I would say this is blasphemy. And the ecumenical movement, it teaches then that all these different branches have an equal claim to being the church of Christ. But this outward show of unity is really empty. It is a superficial unity. It has no depth because it lacks a shared faith, the faith of Christ, the truth, the living presence of Christ. The ecumenical movement uses Christian terms like brotherhood, unity, love. But these words are empty if it isn't a single shared faith. The ecumenical movement would take the doctrines of the church and consider them as secondary, worthless. Doctrines that seven ecumenical councils established and protected, that martyrs shed their blood to protect and defend. The faith of Christ given to the apostles, protected through the centuries, given to us to share with our descendants, our children. We must not let the ecumenical movement stamp on the doctrines of Christ. And the ecumenical movement doesn't simply wish to attack the church. It is more than this. The ecumenical movement stems from a kind of chiaelism, a belief in a, a worldly kingdom that will be built by men on earth, millenarianism, that idea of a thousand year reign and so on. If we look at the, the dollar bill, it has the Masonic image of the pyramid with the final stone missing. This is a symbol of the kingdom yet to be fulfilled and established by men, finally to be built. There was a Scottish um, group of masons who, who printed in the 60s and 70s in America a magazine called The New Age. And this New Age is at the heart of Masonic belief. And it is at the heart of ecumenism. That all the churches will gather together, casting aside their differences of doctrine and belief the heart of orthodoxy is very different.
to these other Christian groups. We do not believe simply in a worldly manifestation of our faith. Our faith is manifested in our lives and in our worship and in our icons and our hymns. But more importantly, it is the inward transformation of our hearts that our faith brings in the life of the church. We are being transformed through the sacraments, through God's grace within the life of the church, that the image of God which was never destroyed, which was scarred and marred by our sin, is being restored to the likeness of Christ once more. We must discover the kingdom of God, not to build one on earth like some human institution. The purpose of the church is not to change the world as such, but to change us, transform us, through God's grace that we may be transformed into Christ's likeness once more, that the kingdom of God within us may change us, that we may enter the eternal kingdom of God at our death. Thank you.